Welcome everyone to our second morning session. I'm going to start off with a joke. <laughs> a physicist, and a chemist, and an economist are stranded on an island. And uh, they have no food. And luckily one day, this one can of food washes up on shore. And uh, they're debating over how to open it, since they don't have any tools, they don't have any equipment. How do we, how do we get this, this can of food open? And the physicist says, well, we could uh, go up to this cliff and drop it, and that would open the can, the force, because of the gravity, falling down, it would open the can. It would be a little bit of a mess, but we could clean it up and eat the food. And the chemist says, well, yeah, that's one thing that we could do. But another option we have is we could make a small fire, put the can on top of the fire, and the, the pressure would build up inside the can, and, and that would open it up. That would also make a bit of a mess. And so they both look at the economist and ask him, what, what should we do? How, do you have any ideas of how we could open this can of food? And the economist says, well, first let's assume that we have a can opener. <laughs> So obviously, this, uh, this sort of uh, joke doesn't apply to the Austrian school, only to the neoclassical um, economists. And so this is the, the school of thought that we're going to be critiquing. We're going to be uh, looking at their, their fundamental assumptions that they make and how they do economics and their, their primary goal in doing economics and contrast it to the Austrian school. This will, this will be a complement to Dr. Israel's uh, lecture yesterday. Uh, we'll cover some of the same ground, but but from different angles, so it, it won't be it won't be a, a pure repeat. So just to get started, let's uh, talk about the the method of, of economics and, and how we approach economics. Mises and Rothbard advocate a sort of methodological dualism, uh, meaning that we should uh, adopt or adapt our methods for studying things based on the thing that we're studying, based on our subject. So if we're studying atoms, if we're studying rocks, things, inanimate material, these sorts of things, then there's one, there's one way to approach questions related to the way we observe those things behaving. And if we are studying something totally different, like man, who can think and act and, and make choices and has a mind, then we should change the way that we study that subject because it is fundamentally categorically different. So Rothbard says, therefore, atoms and stones can be investigated, their courses charted and their paths plotted and predicted, at least in principle, to the minutest quantitative detail. People cannot. Every day, people learn. Some professors might dispute that. <laughs> adopt new values and goals and change their minds. People cannot be slotted and predicted as can objects without minds or that or without the capacity to learn and choose. And this is in uh, his great preface to Mises's uh, book, Theory and History. And the idea here is, the reason I put this out here is because the, in the neoclassical branch, the neoclassical school of economics, they, they have adopted the methods and, um, yeah, the methods of, of the natural sciences. They, they have what's called physics envy, where they, they want to use the calculus, they want to use all of the precise measurement and, lab and have laboratory uh, experiments and settings and assumptions in the way that they do economics. And Rothbard and Mises show that this is, this is totally incorrect. We can't do that because our subject matter is fundamentally different than the subject matter of the natural sciences. So it, it's a little bit uh, difficult to define uh, starting points and endpoints for some schools of thought. Uh, so I have just this uh, sort of a general timeline that, that uh, gives you what we, what we think of when we think of uh, neoclassical economics, when it started, and who were the, the main players. So you've probably seen these terms have been used uh, so far this week. There's the, the classical school. Uh, Professor Salerno talked about them and the, the problems that they had with uh, the diamond water paradox. And they, they really couldn't pin down the way that we value goods and therefore uh, where prices come from and how we can talk about prices. And then finally, we had the marginalist revolution in which William Stanley Jevons, Carl Manger, and Leon Valra, they independently discovered or uh, yeah, discovered a, a new way of thinking about human choice and behavior that's based on, on the margins. It's based on, on valuing, valuing discrete goods or actually not, not always discrete in Jevons and Valra's case. But um, 
valuing goods on the margin. So like we, we make decisions over a specific quantity and, and that's how we should think about valuing them and pricing them. So I intentionally drew this arrow uh, to, to come from Jevons and Valra, and I put this little asterisk next to, to Menger. And the reason why is even though we, we typically lump them together as these, these three big players in the marginless revolution, Menger really was doing something fundamentally different. The, the way he approached the, the, the science of economics, the way he, he answered the questions was, was different. He, he employed what's called a causal realist uh, perspective. In, in doing economics. And what that means is that he was, he was interested in the fundamental <clears throat> cause and effect relations. In fact, he, he started off his uh, principles of economics with a broad sweeping claim about how all things are subject to the laws of cause and effect. And uh, the, the realist part is, is referring to the fact that uh, Menger was trying to explain and make sense of real world phenomena. So he was trying to explain how at prices that we can actually see emerge and, and how they might change and what are the conditions by which prices and other economic phenomena uh, change. So it's a causal realist approach, as opposed to the, the approach by Jevons and Valra, which was highly mathematical. So uh, Jevons and Valra, they sort of pioneered the use of math in, in economics. And the idea was that they 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 made these uh, precisive abstractions. They they took the they took some observations and they tried to come up with a tractable mathematical way of describing what they what they see humans doing, even if it didn't even if it wasn't very realistic and even if there, it was divorced from cause and effect. We'll talk more about this later. So uh, they so. Jevons and Valra, they, they, and especially Jevons, they paved the way for folks like uh, Marshall, Pigou, and Pareto to really start what we know as the neoclassical school or branch of economics. And here it's, it's more mathematical. Uh, we saw uh, Dr. Israel give a supply and demand graph and draw consumer surplus and producer surplus, deadweight loss, total welfare. All of this comes from uh, what was started by by these guys and especially Marshall. And then as as we move on, so this is a continuation of the timeline here. Then uh, Keynes, he he was not neoclassical, um, or at least he didn't he didn't do a lot of the stuff that uh, that Marshall and Pigou were doing. Although he did he did credit them as uh, as mentors, or he was trying to follow in their footsteps and and basically fill in the gaps that Marshall had in trying to con trying to answer macroeconomic questions. But it, it, he, was, he was doing something that, that was very different and, and sometimes a rejection of what even the neoclassical economists were doing. And, and Rothbard uh, notes in his uh, <coughs> uh, History of Economic Thought text, Keynes, a beloved student of the great Marshall, realized that the old man had left out what would later, become, later be called macroeconomics and his exclusive emphasis on the micro. So this this was a huge this was a revolution. So what what he did was uh, was brand new on the scene and it revolutionized the way economists uh, uh, do macroeconomics and think about macroeconomics. And uh, so economists after Keynes they're they're left with the the ramblings of this guy in the in the general theory and they're trying to make sense of it and they come up with formal mathematical models. And so some of them tried to reconcile the Keynesian insights, the Keynesian views of the macroeconomy with what we know about the consumer based on neoclassical micro. And, and so this, this was called the neoclassical synthesis. It's basically formalizing, mathematizing uh, what, was, uh, uh, what Keynes wrote about. And so this, this was primarily done by Samuelson and Hicks. Hicks uh, pioneered the ISLM model, which you might be familiar with, as well as guys like uh, Robert Solo with their, with their growth models. But then uh, these, these models, um, they took a reputational hit in the 1970s. So the, the Keynesian models predicted, uh, through, through the uh, Phillips curve, they predicted this short-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. And that, that broke down in the 1970s. We had inflation and unemployment increasing at the same time. And so a lot of people were trying to answer this question, how do we, how do we deal with that? And uh, as a result of this, trying to answer that question, we had uh, a bunch of new branches coming off and trying to answer the question in different ways. We had the Chicago School led by Milton Friedman. We had the supply-side economics, public choicers. And then we had um, 
what's called a new classical macro, uh, which tried to uh, bring, tr tried to go back to the original neoclassical conception of consumers and build macro up from that. And so it's it's interesting. There's all this new and neo and new Keynesian and neo Keynesian and all these all these uh, schools that are emerging. But then based on that, that they there was a there was also a new Keynesian school that they were arguing with, and they decided to compromise and come together, especially on discussing the short run. And that gave us the uh, what's now I would call dominant the new neoclassical synthesis, which is you've got some of the neoclassical macro mixed with some. Keynesian stuff about uh, sticky wages and so on. So I just wanted you to see how how the neoclassical school s sort of developed and who the main players were, just so that there's some uh, familiar familiarity with that uh, through the especially through the 20th century. But what are the how how would we define the neoclassical economics? What are some of the the fundamental assumptions? And so th there's uh, s some broad agreement on this, and this is just taken from a. Uh, like an encyclopedic type entry. Um, th the first assumption is that people have rational preferences among outcomes. And we'll see in just a moment that this term rational has, has a lot of weight. It's got a lot of baggage. It's, it's carrying a lot. So what they, what they mean by rational is, is very peculiar. It's, uh, it's much different than, than what the Austrians uh, consider rational preferences or rational behavior. Second, individuals maximize utility and firms maximize profits. So you might already anticipate some of the Austrian critiques of this. Uh, I, I think it's safe to say that firms seek to maximize profits, but they still conceive of it in a, in a very different way. And finally, people act independently on the basis of full and relevant information. So <clears throat> let's, uh, let's begin unpacking this rationality assumption that's in neoclassical economics. And you'll notice that it's uh, it's divorced from what we consider, or how we even think about our own choices, or our own actions. And we're we're going to notice that they they make a lot of these formal assumptions for the sake of mathematical tractability, so so that they can take a derivative of an indifference curve, so that they can find an optimal consumption bundle for the consumer and ensure that it exists. And it's not necessarily starting from the ground up, the ground being reality, starting from reality and then building the science of economics. So they, they make assumptions about uh, complete preferences uh, and transitivity, which has implications regarding uh, different choices that, could, that, that people can make across time. And, and uh, the, there's really no argument over the reflexivity. It's, it's one that's, that's sort of true by definition. But then you'll notice that they add some extra assumptions on top of that. And like if you're feeling dizzy <laughs> looking at all this, then that's at least one indication that there's, there is, uh, they are divorced from the way regular people think and act. So they, they say that our preferences are, are continuous, which has implications for the fact that we make decisions over discrete goods. Uh, they have assumptions about local non-satiation and convexity. And really, really the main point of all of these, like I said, is so that we can get nice, clean answers in our math problems. It's so that we can arrive at a result and, and think about consumers' um, behavior in a mathematical sort of way without any severe difficulties. Okay, so let's contrast this with the, uh, the Austrian view of rationality. What is it? What is an Austrian economist? What does Mises mean by rationality? It simply means that we have reasons, we have subjective reasons uh, for our actions, that we're mo motivated in uh, particular ways to act in a certain way. And so Mises says the ultimate end of action is always the satisfaction of some desires of the acting man, since nobody's in a position to substitute his own value judgments for those of the acting individual, it is vain to pass judgment on other people's aims and volitions. So <clears throat> what, what we mean by rationality is, is not smart. We, we're not saying that everybody is smart. Far from it. <laughs> we're, we're not saying that uh, people are calculating computers, that they, that they enter in when they're walking down the grocery store aisles, that they've got their graphing calculator out and they're typing things and making sure that they're... That they're um, their purchasing decisions matches some sort of preconceived utility function. That's not what Austrians mean by rationality. 
all we mean is that we, we have a reason, and it's our own reason for acting. So it's just simply having a, a reason. So human action is rational by definition. It's, it's impossible to falsify or, de or deny this because of simply the way that human action is defined. OK, so where, does the, where do these assumptions, starting assumptions, take the neoclassical economists? The, the, the main framework that they use to, to think about consumer decision making is, uh, is with indifference curves and their corollary utility functions. So in their, in their models, they have individual agents selecting bundles of goods, not one good at a time or one unit at a time, like we see in uh, Menger's work in, in the marginalist revolution. Individual agents selecting bundles of goods to consume to maximize their utility. So that there's this idea that we can consume the right combinations and quantities of goods to achieve and there's, there's a lot of debate over this, achieve a level of utility. And of course, we've already discussed this week about the, the issues with that phrase itself. What is the level of utility? And uh, at least one way to interpret what the neoclassical, neoclassicals are doing is that they are assuming, or, or at least they're implying, cardinal utility. A lot of them try to back out of that by with this escape hatch based on linear transformations of utility curves. And so what they say is, well, yeah, we're treating it like it's cardinal, but since any one utility function could be linear, could be transformed, could be moved up and down or left and right to, to any other utility function, so we can change the shape of it to reflect any other set of ordinal preferences, it, we're doing this but we're not, we're not really saying that utility is cardinal. So that's, they do have a, sort of a, an escape hatch there. <clears throat> but let's, let's continue. So in order for the calculus to work, if you know anything about calculus, you have to have a, a continuous and, and smooth curve so that you can find tangent lines. So when you're taking a derivative, uh, perhaps of, of a curve like you see on the right, uh, you, need to, you need to have a unique tangent line that crosses the the, uh, the, the function that you're considering at one unique point. And what that means is, since you've got goods on both axes, you have good x and good y on, on both of the axes, it means that in order, in order to say that you have differentiable indifference curves, it means that you have to have continuous goods. So the idea that you could buy 1.417 sandwiches as opposed to 1.417000000, so on and so on, one sandwiches. So the idea is that uh, we can we buy fractions of goods. The the neoclassicals have an escape hatch for this as well. Uh, they they will sometimes say that it's still useful for approximations of our of how consumers make choices. So even even if we do get a fractional result for a good, then. The, then the consumer in question would round up or round down, depending. So the goods are continuous, and uh, utility is given by a mathematical function. Uh, and just as an example, a very commonly used one is this Cobb-Douglas form. So the, you, one person's utility is a function of their consumption of good x and good y, and it's equal to x to the alpha times uh, y to the beta. And so you have this utility function, and if you set... Um, utility constant, then you get the indifference curves over there. So wh what this means is that you can have one given level of, of utility for different combinations of the goods in question. So you, th what they say is that there, if, if you have a certain bundle of goods, so say 10x and 10y, and if you consider moving to 9x, then there's a certain amount of y that you could be compensated with and have the same level of utility. Said another way, you would be indifferent between those two combinations, those two bundles of goods. OK, uh, our choices are constrained by a budget. And the, and the, the budget line, is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a line. It's linear. And so we, so we, we, find, the, we find the tangency. We see where the, the <clears throat> we, we try to get to the highest indifference curve based on what we're allowed to with our, with our budget set. And so you, you can see that they at least imply. They, they might not actually think that real people are doing this, but in the way that they're doing this, this whole process, they're implying that agents 
solve a constrained optimization problem. So you have to maximize you, your utility, achieve the highest level of utility that you can uh, while you're constrained by a budget. And so just, just to do like one, I, I've got a, some, some points against this, point out some issues with this, but let's just do like one big picture sort of reflection here. How many of you do calculus when you're walking down the aisles of the grocery store? <laughs> okay, you people. <laughs> some people raise their hands. So, <clears throat> of course we don't do this. We, we, we don't think about these sorts of things when we're making decisions. And so that, that's at least one proof that, there, that this sort of way of thinking about the way consumers uh, make choices is divorced from reality. And I think even some neoclassical economists would agree with that statement. So yeah, it's, it's divorced from reality, but it's helping us achieve our other goals. And we'll talk about those other goals in a second. Okay, but before that, let's contrast to the way we think about consumers and consumer decision making in causal realist or Austrian economics. So we say individuals act to bring about a preferred state. So there's this very tight connection. It's, it's inextricable, the connection between action and preference. In fact, uh, Murray Rothbard famously claimed that our, our preferences are only demonstrated in action. So he, in the Toward a Reconstruction of Utility and Welfare Economics that was cited by Dr. Israel yesterday, he, he emphasizes this claim. Preference can only be demonstrated in action. Action is the use of means for a purpose. So there's the rationality aspect here. The attainment of an end. Notice it's not to achieve a level of utility. It's not to, not to maximize a, a utility function subject to a budget constraint. In action, less important ends are foregone to attain more important ends. So this, the sort of, of, of thing the, the sort of way that we conceive of, of consumers making decisions is based on discrete margins and we're making qualitative judgments. And when we walk down the grocery store aisle, we, we consider the, what we're being asked to forego, what are we being asked to pay in monetary terms in exchange for the good that we would receive. And, and, and that's, that's all, that's it. So we don't make grand assumptions about the completeness of preferences or the transitivity of preferences or all of these other assumptions. All, all, we, all we really need to know and really need to explain and talk about is the fact that one choice was made. Yes, I will accept this jar of peanut, this jar of peanut butter in exchange for the amount of money that's being asked of me. So, so that's it. It's, so it's very, it's bounded, but it's, it's powerful because it is causal and realist. It's not divorced from reality. Okay, so now let's do some, some, some real criticism here, some real comparisons at least. So the two approaches are definitely answering different questions. In the neoclassical approach, the goal is to model behavior for the sake of making good predictions. So, and this, uh, this is really highlighted by Milton Friedman. And what he, what he claims is that the, the goal is for us to be able to make good predictions about, about how humans behave. And, and this goes back to the, the adoption of the, the methods of natural science. So the, the goal in natural science is to, is to make good predictions about how different things will behave depending on the field. And so the way neoclassical economists have translated that is, well, we want to make good predictions about how people behave. So we want to be able to make good predictions. And so if we, if we have mathematical models, then we can use stats and regressions and econometrics that we learned about yesterday to, to extrapolate and say, here's, here's our best guess of how people will behave in, in different circumstances. Or, or even how, how they might respond to, to policy. In the causal realist perspective, the goal is to explain and understand real world phenomena. So, so we see there's a big difference there. In, uh, consumer behavior is, is explained in different ways. In the neoclassical approach, we see that, they, that consumers use or act as if they use calculus to make decisions. And like I said, in the causal realist approach, we say that consumers make qualitative judgments over discrete options. The elements, the things that we're choosing over are conceived in very, very different ways. In the neoclassical approach, they have continuous goods and they're consumed to achieve a certain level of utility. And in the causal realist approach, we have discrete goods that are consumed to attain a unique end. Uh, and actually, I, I could make this um, 
this comparison even more uh, striking. In the neoclassical approach, it's all about bundles. So to say that, that uh, continuous goods are consumed, that's actually not even quite right. They, they say continuous goods as elements of a bundle of goods are, are consumed to, to achieve a certain level of utility. And this has uh, really important implications for just the way we think about diminishing marginal utility, uh, which is a necessary element or a necessary conclusion in Austrian economics, but it's something that just has to be imposed as an assumption ex post in the, in the neoclassical sense. And uh, finally, the scope of the consumer's knowledge is very different. In the neoclassical approach, in order for you to have uh, indifference curves over all of these different quantities of goods and over all the goods, you have what they're assuming or implying is that the consumer has knowledge of all possible bundles, knowledge of all goods. And so and to make even one decision about the purchase of one good, it means that you have to rule out an infinite number of alternatives, which is very, very strange. It's not how we make decisions. In the causal realist view, the consumer only necessarily considers the end attained and the highest ranked end foregone. So we're just thinking about the chosen state of affairs and the the best possible alternative state of affairs that we're foregoing by choosing one course of action. So <clears throat> Austrians have a lot of uh, <clears throat> critiques of the neoclassical approach centered on different um, aspects of it. One, one uh, fundamental disagreement is uh, the, just the concept of indifference itself. So if you read Rothbard uh, in the article I mentioned earlier, you'll, you'll notice that he he points out that indifference cannot be demonstrated in action. There's no way for us to show by acting in choice that we are indifferent between things. And so, so what that means is that the neoclassicals are, are doing something different. They're thinking about preferences in a different way. For them, it must be like this sort of psychological, um, not really a state of mind, but just almost like what you would get from survey data. So like if you just ask somebody, uh, what, is, what is your preference between this and that? And if somebody's like, they just sort of shrug their shoulders and say, well, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good either way, which is something that we do, you know, sometimes. Like, I, I don't care where we go to dinner, you guys pick. That, that's what the neoclassicals are thinking about when they're thinking about preferences. It's just what might be stated or, or what might pre-exist in our minds b before we actually go through with, with choices. However, like I said, for Austrians, it's, Preference and choice are they're connected in and they're integrated in a way that can't that, yeah they can't be separated that's what integrated means so they so what that means is there's no there's no way for us to demonstrate in action that we are indifferent between two two goods or, or two ends but that's a that's a fundamental starting point for neoclassical consumer theory. Uh, there's a, a violation of, of Occam's razor with neoclassical economics. Um, and so by, by taking consumer choice and turning it into um, a bunch of mathematical symbols and then playing with the, the math to, to get different math results and then taking that and trying to map it onto the real world uh, violates the, the principle that uh, we shouldn't have duplication of entries, that we should keep things simple. And, and, and what the Austrians show is that you can, in fact, explain human behavior and talk about human behavior in a way that doesn't resort to these, these new symbols and new, new uh, equations and so on. There's, uh, in, in the Austrian school, there's healthy respect for the boundaries of economics, but that doesn't exist. So notice that in my description of the way neoclassicals think about indifference, it's appealing to, to psychology. It's, and, and throughout the, the neoclassical field, the way they do things, they, they have to make very precisive abstractions. They have, to, they have to say that people act in a certain way, and the reason that they make those assumptions is so that they can have models that spit out results that allow them to, to make predictions. Um, but in, in economics, in Austrian economics, we, we make non-precisive abstractions. And to the extent that we make precisive abstractions, it's usually for pedagogical reasons or just to tease out something, but not as a model for the way the real world operates. Uh, I'll, I'll have some recommended reading at the end that, that, that clears that up. Like I said, we've got very different uh, conceptions of rationality. Uh, with uh, marginal utility and especially diminishing marginal utility, um, it's it's not necessary. It's it's 
it's something that has to be added in ex post in the neoclassical framework, but it's something that's that's logically true. It's something that we de derive through the, through the steps of starting with human action and, and thinking about the way that humans behave. Diminishing margin utility must exist, but it's just something that has to be. It's a it's a new constraint that has to be added to the neoclassical models. One final thing that I that I mentioned here it's uh, it's that the neoclassicals have an aversion to taste changing. So if if we want to have good models that make predictions, it means that you have to make some assumptions about the constancy of preferences. It means that you have to assume that the utility functions and, and the way we think about consumers behaving doesn't change much over time, and or in some cases not at all. And so there's this uh, quote here from, uh, uh, it's called De Gustibus Non Es Disputanum by Sticker, Stickler and Be Becker. It says, our title seems to us to be capable of another and preferable interpretation, that tastes neither change capriciously nor differ importantly between people. On this interpretation, one does not argue over taste for the same reason that one does not argue over the Rocky Mountains. Both are there, will be there next year too, and are the same to all men. So those, that's some pretty heavy assumptions about like the similarity of people and also how, how preferences don't change at all. And like I said, the reason why they do this is for the, for the sake of, of uh, prediction. Okay, so where did, this, uh, where did this go with macro? So we talked through a bunch of the issues with, with especially consumer theory uh, in neoclassical economics, but where, where did it take macroeconomics? So like I said, the, the breakdown of the Phillips curve um, relationship that was expected. So on the right-hand side, that's what the Phillips curve, when it was developed, looked like. So the relationship between inflation and, and the unemployment rate. The, the idea is that uh, there's this short-run trade-off that through monetary policy, we can, we have, um, I think it was Samuelson who called it a menu of choice, where we can just choose what combination of inflation and unemployment that we want. And then, of course, it all broke down. In fact, I, I like to refer to it as the Phillips blob instead of the Phillips curve because, because after a while, we noticed that there is no such relationship. There is no such short-run relationship. It's just an artifact of, of the ISLM in aggregate supply and aggregate demand model. But either way, so this broke down empirically in the 1970s, and, and so economists started suspecting issues with the Keynesian system. If only they had asked us about it. <laughs> um, and so uh, they, they came up with this dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model, which is it's based on, on a, applying shocks to a system uh, that represents the macroeconomy. And you can see how this might help them answer the Phillips curve question, because if, if, we, jump, uh, if we jump in the diagonal direction this way, then we can just blame it on a shock. We can just say that there was, like, it, for example, there was a supply shock that caused us to move to a new level, and so now the new Phillips curve is, is somewhere else, and that's why it looks like it's a blob. It's still a curve, but it's just moving around because of shocks. So uh, the pictures over here just show how even they conceive of it. So there, there's the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, New York uh, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. It's just a mess of math, right? So it, it seems like uh, that betrays a view of... Uh, maybe they, they sort of see their models in the same way that we see their models. Um, and then they have uh, uh, th this other uh, schematic just shows how the shocks and the different agents in the model are, are related to each other. Okay, so let's compare this to the way Austrians think about uh, macroeconomics. For, oh, first of all, they, they called this the sort of bridging of the gap, uh, bringing in micro foundations. So the, the idea is that we're going to take the neoclassical consumer and reconcile it with the, the Keynesian macro. And then, the, yeah, there's these issues with the Phillips curve in the 1970s, and so we'll introduce a model that's based on, on having us allow uh, shocks to the, to the system. And so they, that, that was their way of integrating micro and macro. It's like, let's take this neoclassical consumer and try to integrate it, try to, to formalize it with with the Keynesian results, basically. Um, and so this, that's very different compared to the way Austrians think about economics in general. And for, for Austrians, economics, the micro and the macro, is a, it's a complete integrated whole. 
So we, we do start at the individual level, and then from there we can, we can move on up through diminishing margin utility and talking about market prices and profit maximization, talking about where money comes from and what banks do, all the way up to things that we can call economy-wide phenomena. So it's, it's all an integrated whole. It's not, it's not just plucking this, this uh, mathematical model out of, out of micro-consumer theory and plucking it into a totally separate macro model. That's not, that's not what Austrians uh, think about when we think about a macroeconomic way of looking at things with micro-foundations. It's all an integrated whole. So in Austrian macro, we've got, uh, we've got Bumbavik's concentric circles. These are all ju just different ways that the structure of production is, has been depicted. And what's, what's notable is that this sort of thing applies to the individual level. So we can think about Caruso as, as having a structure of production and taking time to produce capital goods and other intermediate products on the way to some final consumer good that he desires. But it, we can also think about it uh, applying to a macro economy. So we can think about for a whole economy, there are stages of production and, and capital is, is, uh, is being produced on the way to making a, a large mass of heterogeneous capital, uh, excuse me, consumer goods for, for consumers. And so we've got uh, Hayek's version, then Rothbard's version. And then famously, uh, the Hayekian triangle was turned the other direction by Roger Garrison. <laughs> Great contribution there. <clears throat> Allows us to think about time moving from left to right. I think I had a, uh, I mentioned that uh, feature in my last lecture. So, so this, is, this is how Austrian economists think about the macroeconomy, very different from the way that the uh, neoclassicals do and, and what we see in the new neoclassical synthesis. Okay, so where, where has this uh, taken the neoclassical economists? Where has this taken the mainstream? It's uh, certainly true that, that they are questioning themselves, which is good. I would, I'm glad they're questioning themselves. Uh, so here's Noah Smith says that uh, there's no question that mainstream academic macro, macroeconomics failed pretty spectacularly in 2008. So they're noticing that these models that have been designed for the sake of prediction are not doing very good at prediction. Paul Krugman says uh, too much of it involved making assumptions about how unmeasurable things affected other unmeasurable things. Paul Romer, this is one of my favorite quotes, in the, in the bottom left, Paul Romer said, presenting a model is like doing a card trick. Everybody knows that there will be some sleight of hand. There is no intent to deceive because no one takes it seriously. <laughs> perhaps our norms will soon be like those in professional magic. It will be impolite, perhaps even an ethical breach <laughs> to, <laughs> to reveal how someone's trick works. So the, they, they're noticing all of these problems with the real business cycle models and, and the um, other general equilibrium models that they have. Uh, Solo, who, who was featured on my timeline of the big players, uh, said, I do not think that the currently popular DSGE models pass the smell test. Later, he said, the protagonists of this idea make a claim to respectability by asserting that it is founded on what we know about microeconomic behavior, but I think this claim is generally phony. Greg Mankiw, uh, author of a very widely used uh, principles textbook, says, from the standpoint of macroeconomic engineering, the work of the past several decades looks like an unfortunate wrong turn. So they're, they're noticing that these, what they've conjured up is, is it's basically worthless. Finally, uh, here's a, a president of uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Uh, why does an economy have business cycles? Why do asset prices move around so much? At this stage, macroeconomics has little to offer by way of answers to these questions. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm glad that they're noticing this, and I hope it sort of picks up steam, especially with uh, uh, what we see in a lot of empirical economics today. There's a lot of uh, talk about the replication crisis. So it seems, like, it seems like the mainstream is doing a little bit of introspection, and that's good. OK, so contrast this to what we see in the Austrian school. Even though we do not hang our hat on making predictions, I, I scoured old Mises Daily articles and found this uh, interview with uh, Sean Corrigan where he was, he was predicting with, with almost scary accuracy what would happen later on. And this was in 2002, 
2002, when nobody was talking about it at that point. So people started talking about it, uh, saying that there could be a housing bubble around the corner in like 2005, 2006. But even then, it was just, it was sort of on the fringe. Um, and so he said, uh, the appraisal process and home loans has been corrupted in the boom. Even with the inflation and the prices that we've seen, this is in 2002, remember, it's worse than it looks because house values aren't there in the first place. And then also, uh, famously, Mark Thornton predicted the, the housing bubble. And uh, the earliest one that I could find was in 2004, where he said, given the government's encourage of lax lending practices, home prices could crash, bankruptcies would increase, and financial companies, including the government-sponsored mortgage companies, might require another taxpayer bailout. It's like, wow. It's like it's four years ahead of time. He's, he's basically just laying out what, uh, what's going to happen. And so why, why is this? Why are, the, why are those associated with the Austrian school able to make these predictions? And I would argue it's because of our causal realist approach. I would say it's because the world is ruled by cause and effect. Certain macroeconomic policies, like increases in the money supply, have certain effects. And the way that we think about those effects is, is based on our understanding of, of real humans making choices and the, all of the conclusions that we draw from the edifice of economic theory that's based on human action as a, as a starting point. And so, so it applies to the real world and it makes sense. And even though we, we understand the inherent unpredictability of the future, it seems like, like we can make very, even very specific predictions about what's happening in response to policies even uh, like half a decade later. Okay, so uh, let's, let's conclude here, and then I've got another slide of recommended reading. So the Austrian approach is, is focused on understanding real-world cause and effect. Neoclassical economists like to use mathematical models to model consumer behavior, firm behavior, and macroeconomic phenomena. Mises and Rothbard present a unified and systematic, but very importantly, bounded science of economics. One, one thing that we've noticed in the past few decades in economics is that there's all of these new fields. There's health economics and labor economics and energy economics and all these different fields, and they're splintering off. And, and as compared to what we see in the Austrian school, while scholars will specialize in answering a certain question, they would all say that the, the body of work, the, the body of economic theory that they're relying on to do their research, is all, it's cohesive. Uh, I, I often tell this story. There was one time that I, was, I went to a macroeconomist paper presentation. So the, there were these weekly seminars, and a, a macro guy was, was giving this presentation. And I'm sure it was one of the representative agent DSGE models, something along those lines. And I remember a labor economist leaned over to me in the middle of, it, of his presentation and said, I have no idea what's going on. So, <laughs> so, there's, so there's, there's a fundamental disconnect between what's happening in these silos in, in mainstream economics. As, like I said, as compared to what we see in the Austrian school, where it's very cohesive, systematic, and, and very importantly, bounded. So we do know that there are boundaries to what we can explain and what, what we can talk about based on economic theory. So we know that we can't get into the particulars of human action. If somebody asks the question, why does, why does uh, Joe prefer um, peanut butter over almond butter? And the, that's something that economics can't really answer. That you'd have to go to some other field. You'd have to use a different set of theories, different set of laws to, to explain that, that preference, because that's a particular of action. All, all that we can discuss in, in economics is action as such and, and its consequences. So the differences between the Austrian school and the mainstream begin at the most fundamental level, at the methodological level. So should we use logic to derive economic theory or empiricism, to basically just collect a bunch of data and find a correlation? And also um, differences in the goal of economic science. Are we trying to understand the real world or are we trying to predict? And if you're trying to predict, then you have to, you have to abandon the real world. You have to come up with these formal models and use empirical methods and statistics to, to try to, to do that. Okay, so here's some reading. If you're interested in this topic, uh, Roderick Long has a, one of my favorite articles. Uh, it's called Realism and Abstraction in Economics, Aristotle and Mises versus Friedman. And here he's talking about the, 
the difference between precisive and non-precisive abstractions and the what what we achieve by in Austrian economics, what we achieve by having non-precisive abstractions. So what what this means is in order for us to think about the real world, we have to we have to um, simplify things so much because the 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 real world is very complex. We can't we can't just map we we can't just take the real world and try to map it over into some sort of uh, fully complex simulation. So we have to make simplifying assumptions. And Long points out that we what we can do is we can specify as, as certain things being absent. So we can ignore ignore the question of why somebody prefers peanut versus almond butter. We can just leave that outside. That, and the, the answer to that question doesn't really matter uh, because what we're trying to explain is something different. We're just trying to explain uh, like. The, the fact that they do make this choice and what are the impacts of their of the supply of it increasing or or their demands changing but but actually asking the further question of well what's causing their demand to change I mean with some exceptions we we don't make uh, precise claims about what's inside their head what's what's inside their psychology a, a former summer fellow uh, Sam Selikoff uh, wrote this great paper that's available on his uh, on his website called Understanding Neoclassical Consumer Theory, and he does a very good job of not attacking straw men. So he sets up the, the neoclassical framework in a very fair way, and he's pointing out some internal problems along the way, and then he ends with a, a full Austrian critique. It's, it's an excellent read. I recommend you check it out. Uh, uh, Murray Rothbard uh, wrote Toward a Reconstruction of Utility and Welfare Economics. This was just a devastating blow to neoclassical economics, in my opinion. It, and I think that if... I think it could be convincing to many mainstream economists. I think that if they read it, some of them might actually convert. So maybe we should, you know, drop this like pamphlets or something <laughs> around around mainstream departments. And also, uh, Rothbard has uh, many great articles on the way Austrians do economics and contrasting with the mainstream, uh, found in Economic Controversy Controversies, which is a, um, a great collection of his work. So thank you very much.